In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the trends in educational achievement linked to ethnicity and the internal and external factors which can affect and influence um, those trends. So we're going to be combining both the external and internal in this lecture video rather than having two separate ones. So to begin with, we're going to look, let's look really at trends. So on the screen is a graphical uh, graph showing the average attainment eight score for um, students at GCSE. So this is attainment eight rather than progress eight. Now, from our previous um, lecture looking at measuring educational achievement, we did notice that although achievement of ethnic minority, certain ethnic minorities might be lower, the progress they make through their key stage three and four education is actually much higher than that of white students. So what does this graph tell us? Well, first of all, it's looking at the national average of a attainment eight score of 46.5. We can see that Pakistani and black African um, students are very close to the national average. Um, and white students are close to the national average. So there's not much difference in their educational achievement at GCSE. However, Indian and Chinese students tend to significantly um, achieve higher than the national average and in particular and the, the white majority. The groups that tend to do less well and underachieve um, at GCSE are the Black Caribbean students and the Irish traveller or Gypsy Roma students. And there's quite a considerable underachievement there with the Gypsy Roma, Roma um, achieving on average 18.2 and the Irish traveller community uh, students achieving 21.9. So we can see that there are some significant differences there. And what we can also see is that we can't combine students into just black or into just Asian students, although the graph does do that, because there are some significant differences within those communities. As we said, Indian students are quite considerably outperforming Pakistani, um, Bangladeshi and other Asian students, achieving on average 56 points three in GCSE. And when we look at black students, black African students are significantly outperforming black Caribbean students with the black African students scoring an average of 47.5 and black Caribbean students averaging uh, 39.6. And so we do need to be aware that we need to deal with these ethnic groups as separate entities and not just clump them all together. Now again, even with the white um, community, uh, white students, we can see that, yes, um, white British are achieving close to the national average and not so different from what, what people who identify themselves as white other with 46.1 and 47 respectively. But the white Irish students are significantly outperforming all other white ethnic uh, white students scoring an average of 52.2 and then we've got the Irish traveller and the Gypsy Roman, Roma students significantly underperforming so we do need to consider these groups as separate entities rather than as one cohesive homogenous group. Now if we look at the A-level um, trends so the national average for achieving at least three A's at A level is 12.9%. So that's 12.9% of those who do A levels achieve three A's or more. Okay. And what we can see here is that the Chinese and Indian students, again, are massively and significantly overachieving um, three in A levels compared to the national average with Chinese students achieving 22.5% of the students achieving three A's or above and Indian students at 15.3. Now the graph does show that the Irish traveller community is at 28.6. 
Now, what we have to bear in mind here is the travel at the number of Irish traveller students who stay on in school and do A levels is very, very low. And therefore, it is very difficult to generalise that to the entire Irish um, traveller community um, because of the numbers being as low as they are. Um, in 1998, there were only there were under 20 students who identified as Irish traveller compared to the thousands who identified as white or Chinese or um, Indian. So we kind of have to take that as more of an anomaly rather than a generalised statistic. OK, so this kind of shows that there is some significant differences in educational achievement by ethnicity. And here we are talking specifically about attainment. We're not talking about progress. That would be something entirely different. So what is it that causes these trends? What is it that's making the, the um, creating the statistics? What, what are we looking at in terms of factors? And as before, we are going to break this down into internal and external. And some of this is going to be familiar to you because it's applying what we've already done in terms of roles and processes, in terms of um, external factors, and applying it to the um, trends in ethnicity. So first of all, we're going to look at the external factors. So we're going to be looking at cultural deprivation, which we've already looked at before when we looked at class um, and educational achievement. And we're also going to look at material deprivation. Now, with ethnicity, we do need to look as well at racism in wider society and how that can impact educational achievement. OK, so it is important that you are um, not just describing these issues, but you are actually um, applying it to ethnicity and educational achievement. Then we're going to look at the internal factors. And again, we've looked at these in roles and processes. We've looked at these in class and educational achievement. We're now applying them to educate to ethnicity. So we'll look at labelling. We'll look at pupil identities. But we're going to add in here institutional racism and looking at how the school system, not schools as individuals, although that may happen, um, school system, the education system, could be considered racist and therefore disadvantaging ethnic minority students. OK. So let's start with the first external factor of cultural deprivation. We've discussed previously what we mean by cultural deprivation, and it's about not having the skills, the inherent knowledge or experiences that will aid educational achievement. And we've stated before that the education system is quite a middle class institution and there are, there are assumptions of knowledge, understanding and skill that perhaps that are very much middle class. And we're not saying that um, ethnic minorities can't be middle class. They can and they are. But what we're looking at here is how some of these assum assumed skills and knowledge are not necessarily apparent in some ethnic minorities. So the first thing we're going to look at is language. And as we've talked about before, there is the restrictive code and the elaborated code. Now, the Bernstein obviously didn't say that one was better than the other. He just said that they were different. And it's argued, particularly um, through linking to um, socioeconomic backgrounds, the ethnic minorities lack the linguistic development at home or the linguistic um, the access to the elaborated code at home, which puts them at a disadvantage in school. Now, we can see from, from um, the statistics that from um, the census and various other um, data gathered by the government, the ethnic minorities are proportionately more working class compared to the ethnic majority. So there will be those who are in the middle classes and have the middle class 
la uh, elaborated code and these cultural experiences. But the vast majority of ethnic minorities are within the working class. So they are going to be socialised into the restricted language code. And as we said before, schools tend to work on the elaborated code, which means that they are again immediately at a disadvantage when starting school because they're not used to that language system. We also have to take into account English as a second language and that for many ethnic minorities, they're not just necessarily bilingual, but they could be multilingual children speaking multiple languages in the home, not just English. And Bowker, B-O-W-K-E-R, in his book, The Education of Coloured Immigrants in 1968, stated that it is a lack of standard English that puts the biggest barrier in front of ethnic minorities when it comes to their education. Now we do have to bear in mind that Bolker was writing in 1968 when we had, where we, at the time of the Windrush generation, there were lots of um, first generation immigrants coming to the UK. So it's likely that he was, the data he was collecting and the study he was conducting was on a vast majority of first generation immigrants. And this may not be the case with second, second, third, fourth, fifth generation immigrants. The second thing we need to think about is family and support. And for many sociologists, they argue that dysfunctional family types can have a, dis a distinct impact on ethnic minority um, underachievement. So Murray, from the new lovely New Right perspective, suggests that because Afro-Caribbean um, families are more likely to be single mother families, um, it means that the children lack the male role models, mothers struggle to socialise their children adequately, and that this leads to educational underachievement because they're going from a possibly a situation with a lack of discipline at home to a school where there is discipline and expectations of behaviour. Now, Murray was writing in the early 80s. So one of the key criticisms that we could put here against Murray, other than the fact that he is himself, is the fact that there is the current data states that there is no evidence to suggest that Afro-Caribbean families are more likely to be lone parent families. They might be cohabiting rather than married, but they're, they're not single parent families. We've also got um, the argument of support and attitudes from home towards education. So Price in 1979 stated that the Asian culture is much more cohesive than the black culture and therefore they are able to ignore um, racism more effectively and as such are not affected by it quite so much and therefore don't have as much um, low self-esteem leading to educational failure. And Bollard and Driver in 1988 argue that Asian families are more pro-school attitude, have a more pro-school attitude than black families because Asian families um, bring that expectation from their, their culture to their lives here in the UK. And if you've seen things like Chinese school and documentaries such as that, in the Asian culture, education is extreme, it's a privilege, it's extremely important. And families are extremely pushy. Um, it's where the phrase tiger parenting comes from, where parents will push their children to be the best. And anything then being number one is not good enough. Now, obviously, this can have the opposite effect to educational achievement. It can lead to burnout and it can lead to um, students not doing so well. But this culture of educational importance can could help to explain why it is that um, Chinese and Indian students are achieving much higher in their education. Now we also have um, this idea from Scrun Scrunton in 1986 
who suggests that it's when ethnic minorities fail to embrace the British culture that they tend to um, lead to um, educational underachievement. And that links us into values and beliefs. So we've got the argument put forward by Arnaud, A-R-N-O-T, that suggests that um, in particular, black African and black Caribbean students are affected by negative school role models, um, which he describes as ultra tough ghetto superstars who reinforce through rap lyrics and vi music videos that education is not as important. It's more about status amongst your peer group that's important than educational achievement. And this sort of media influence gets translated into school behaviours and into educational achievement. We also have um, Hall in 1992 who talks about culture, the, a culture of resistance. And he argues that the impact of slavery um, and the fact that much of black culture, in particular black African culture, has been lost in terms of language, religion, ancestry, etc. It can lead to um, people being less likely or less inclined to integrate and assimilate with the white ethnic majority because they see it as a form of symbolic violence against them, their culture and that they are being told to ignore their ancestry, ignore their religion and their um, traditional cultures in favour of the oppressors, the, the, the slavers who who started um, who brought them to the white majority um, countries such as the UK. And so this culture of resistance can be translated into educational achievement and it will link to one of our internal factors of the ethnocentric curriculum that you're being taught how to be middle class white British <laughs> rather than celebrating cultural diversity. So let's evaluate these, this theory of cultural deprivation in terms of ethnic, major, ethnic minority underachievement or ethnic minority achievement. So let's first look at language. First of all, we've got Bollard and Driver who argue that language problems cease to be a problem by the age of 16. So it wouldn't affect the GCSE and A-level results. They argue that by that point of an in, within the education system, you've become accustomed to the elaborate code. Even if it's not the code that you speak in at home, you are able to access it and you're able to understand it with, by the time you reach your GCSEs and your A-levels. And in 1985, the Swan Report uh, found that when looking at educational achievement of children from multilingual families, bilingual families, and those ethnic minorities who were not multilingual or bilingual, there was very little difference in terms of achievement, actually suggesting that language has very little role to play when it comes to ethnic minority achievement and underachievement. Looking at um, family support, Keddy argues very much that this is a victim blaming um, theory. Keddy argues that when you're blaming the culture of a particular group or familial attitudes towards education as a cause for achievement or underachievement, you're blaming or placing fault on the individual student. It's your fault that you didn't achieve because your family don't value education because of your culture or vice versa. And also with the family structures, as we've pointed out before, Charles Murray's theory that um, it's single parent families and that Afro-Caribbean families are from, are more likely to be um, from a, um, or form a single parent family is actually inaccurate. Census data tells us that this is not the case. 
that you're no more likely to be in a single parent family if you're from a black Caribbean background or a white background or an Asian background or any other background. And his argument that um, single parents are unable to adequately socialise their children into or discipline their children, again, has been completely debunked um, since then. And I know from my experience that um, a lot of the time when it was a case of calling home for bad behaviour in schools, a lot of my students, were, particularly when I worked in London, were far more terrified of me calling their mothers than they were of me calling their dads. So it, this idea that women are or mothers are unable to socialise their children adequately to access the discipline side or engage in the disciplinary side of school has been completely debunked. Now, when we look at values and beliefs, um, the idea of this culture of resistance that's been put forward by um, Hall, we can kind of criticise that by suggesting that perhaps that might be the case for maybe first or second generation immigrants. But most third generation immigrants from studies that have been done have created a hybrid identity where they embrace both their British background as well as their ethnic minority background, be that Black Caribbean, Black African, um, Asian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, whatever. So that by the third generation, this idea of a culture of resistance perhaps doesn't, doesn't quite work any further. And Driver also highlights how ethnicity can be an advantage for um, ethnic minorities because the, these attitudes um, or stereotypes that are put forward create lower expectations, which could, they can then exceed. So maybe that's why we're not necessarily seeing um, as much educational attainment differences. But when we look at progress, we do see those ethnic minority groups exceeding the white majority when comparing how much progress they make over their Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 education. So our next factor comes from flaherty, and this is material deprivation. And we've already looked at what we mean by material deprivation and the idea that it is looking at how, um, how people are unable to afford the hidden costs of education, the uniforms, the resources, the trips, etc but also looking at housing and health and how not being able to afford good housing can affect your health, can affect your ability to study. And what Flaherty found when looking and comparing ethnic minorities to the white majority is that Pakistani and Bangladeshis are three times more likely to be in the poorest fifth of the population, which means that they are living below the poverty line. So those additional educational resources that are required are unlikely to be able to be afforded by these ethnic groups. And they are also more likely to live in um, rundown and um, not very nice accommodations and things like that. They also found that African, Pakistani and Bangladeshis are three more times more likely to be unemployed, unemployment, lack of financial resources which can link to both health wealth uh, health housing and the hidden cost of education and finally 15 percent of majority of minority groups live in overcrowded homes and this means that they are more likely to have um, lack of space for study quiet areas to get on and work do homework they're more likely to have health problems um, due to the overcrowding and therefore it's going to affect their educational achievement. So although the, the material deprivation hasn't changed to what we've talked about before, what we're seeing here is that ethnic minorities are more likely to experience that material deprivation, so therefore are more likely to find it um, to underachieve at educational levels because of that 
material deprivation. But this argument is paradoxical. And what that means is we can't be sure which causes what. Is it that ethnic minorities are underachieving because they're materially deprived? Or do they end up materially deprived because of other factors affecting educational achievement? So, for example, are they more likely to be work, um, education to, to achieve educational underachievement because of, say, racism or institutional racism or some of the internal factors, which then leads them more likely to be unemployed, which leads to the material deprivation and that cycle of poverty? So it, it's a chicken and egg situation. And when it comes to material deprivation, are they materially deprived because they are um, ethnic minorities? Are they materially deprived because they're also working class? So there, there is that kind of questioning where we can't be sure as to why or, or what which came first. Is it the material deprivation or is it the other factors? So the third factor that we're going to look at external is racism in wider society and how this can affect educational achievement. Recently, we have seen a lot of exposure of the racism in wider society. The um, Black Lives Matters process, uh, sorry, protests, and all of those things that have been happening in the last two years, three years. And that, this is not new, this has been going on for a long time, but the, they've become, again, to the forefront of our um, experiences, they we, we know they exist. We know that there is racism in wider society and we have evidence of it. For example, Noon in 1993 sent out um, identical letters to the top 100 companies um, in the UK. They were prospective letters, so they were asking, do you have any jobs? They weren't um, applying for a specific job. They were exactly identical. The only change he made to these letters is he changed the name from Jones, sorry, Evans to Patel, and he changed it from Miss to Mister. And what he found was that those with um, Evans in the title, so the, the letters um, address, um, not address to, the letters that came from Mr. Evans received eight times more replies than those from Mr. Patel and for, or from Miss Evans or Miss Patel. In fact, Miss Patel had the lowest rate of response. Now, these letters were 100% um, identical. The name was the only thing they changed. They had the same qualifications. They had the same um, experience. All he changed was the name, thus showing the racism in wider society when it comes to the workplace. And this may be unconscious bias. It may be conscious. It depends on the company. We don't know. But um, this can this this attitude can then perpetrate uh, perpetuate into the education system. So first of all, the labelling side of things. So in terms of labelling, we see with Noon, we've got that, um, that evidence that people make assumptions about somebody from their name. And that label from wider society, things such as um, black boys are more boisterous, um, black girls are anti-authoritarian. Those sort of stereotypes, those ethnic stereotypes, um, can then go lead back to the education system. And we'll come back to labelling as an internal factor in a minute. You've also got marginalisation. And this is the um, argument that comes from Rex, R-E-X, in 1986. Racism leads to social exclusion and marginalisation. And this can be shown in housing, employment, as well as education. So if you feel like you are on the edge of society, that you're, you're being excluded from society, then you're not going to want to engage in it. And that can lead to anti-school subcultures. Like society doesn't want me here. It doesn't want me to be part of this group. So why would I 
then go backwards to try and be part of it. And that can lead to those anti-school subcultures. And finally, we've got poverty. Um, and again, Rex points out that the um, social exclusion, the marginalisation can lead to greater poverty for ethnic minorities, which then leads into ma uh, material deprivation, which then leads to educational underachievement. So we, we see this racism in wider society bleeding into the education system and educational achievement. It's, it's all, almost like saying, well, society doesn't want me, so why should I try hard at school? Now, as a um, evaluationist, we can talk about rejection of labels. These stereotypes that are, we are seeing can be rejected and we're seeing far more positive ethnic minority role models which go to show that okay society might be racist but you can rise above it to quote michelle obama when they go low we go high so th there is evidence that there is a rejection of these stereotypes these wider um, societal labels um, in modern society. There's also changes in attitudes. We're not there yet, we're not there by any stretch of the imagination, but there is a more multicultural um, attitude in society. And a lot of companies now are doing blind applications. So they won't know your name until they've invited you to interview. So obviously you'd still write your name on the application and your contact details, otherwise that's kind of pointless. But when the person deciding who to interview and who not to interview looks at these applications, they don't see the personal details of the applicant. They just see the experience, the qualifications, etc. And they then from that decide who they want to take for um, interview and who they don't. And finally, we do have changes in law. There are anti-discrimination laws in place. It is illegal to discriminate against somebody based on their ethnicity, their race, their religion, um, their gender, their sexuality, and all of those things. So um, it's making it not just a change in social attitudes, but changes in the law will lead to these um, jobs being, well, they should have been available anyway, but um, leading to higher aspirations because there's nothing stopping anyone from achieving the jobs or the roles that they want. Let's move on to the internal factors and again we're back to our lovely um, factor of labelling and applying labelling to ethnicity and ethnic um, minority achievement and underachievement. Now Interactionists argue that teachers label pupils from different ethnic groups differently um, as a um, kind of unconscious bias scenario. And that's not to say, not therefore saying it's right or it's acceptable, it's not. But these, as we've talked about before with labeling, a lot of labeling comes from an unconscious. Um, thought process rather than conscious thinking. And Gilborn and Udell talk about radicalized, sorry, not radicalized, racialized expectations. And in particular, Gilborn and Udell were looking at um, Black African and Black Caribbean students, where they found that teachers were quick to discipline these students compared to other students for similar behavior. And teachers will misinterpret behaviours and see Black Caribbean and Black um, African students as anti-authoritarian, which creates conflict between the teacher and the pupil, reinforces stereotypes and leads to further problems such as an anti-school subculture. Now Wright was looking at Asian pupils and in his study of a multi-ethnic primary school, he saw that, um, oh, sorry, she found that teachers held very ethnocentric views which affected how they related to the Asian students, including things like leaving them out of discussions, 
using childish language when speaking to them and marginalizing them. So almost suggesting that they won't understand or maybe are coming from a, a first generation, possibly second generation family, rather than um, including them in schools. And these racialized expectations of behavior, which then leads to, so the, the ethnicity of the student is the speculation. The way the teacher te treats that student in the class can lead to elaboration and therefore stabilization. Okay, using Hargreaves three steps of labeling. So we can see how these racialized stereotypes, which perpetuate within the education system and perpetuate within society, can affect educational achievement. We've then also got discipline. And now obviously, um, Gilborn and Yadel already touched on this, but Osler really looked into this in depth and found that Black students are more likely to be both officially or permanently excluded. They're also more likely to receive a fixed term exclusion or suspension, but they're also more likely to be unofficially excluded. And what we mean by this is things like managed moves, where the school says to the parents, perhaps this isn't the school for your child. Perhaps you, should need, you need to look somewhere else to send them. So therefore, they're not officially excluded. They're moved to a new school. OK. Um, black students are also more likely to be put into a pupil referral union, unit. Oh, excuse me. They're excluded from mainstream education. Um, and Bourne links this to the idea that black boys, particularly who, who are more likely to be excluded from school, are treated as some sort of threat. That because of the racialized expectations of black students being more aggressive, more anti-authoritarian, when they stand up for themselves, this can be interpreted as being threatening, which then leads to escalation of behavior, uh, of sanctions, when perhaps it's not that, um, that way. Okay, so this kind of um, discipline can lead to educational underachievement because black uh, uh, ethnic minority students, in particular black students, are excluded from mainstream education. And then we finally have setting and streaming as part of our labeling thing. And this was the work of Foster, who said that the stereotypes of black and Asian students can, can affect which sets and streams they're placed in. The stereotype of Asian students being more academic, more able, places them in more in higher um, sets and streams. So therefore, they're able to access more education or up to, uh, sorry, educational opportunities and therefore exceed expectation in terms of educational attainment. Black students are seen as less able and are put in lower sets and streams and therefore create a self-fulfilling prophecy of underachievement. So labelling then leads into our next factor, which is the pupil identities. So the way that students are, are labelled within school can affect their identity, how they see themselves as an ethnic minority, as a student, as a person. And this is the work of Archer. And Archer states that um, teachers define students by stereotypical typical ethnic identities. We see teachers will see um, an ethnic minority and make assumptions about their ability, their attitudes, their behaviours. This then is shapes the pupil's ethnic identity. I'm from this ethnic minority, so therefore I'm expected to behave this way, which can lead to the self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, Archer argues that teachers a teacher's dominant way of looking at things shapes and defines the pupil identity uh, and, and their ethnic identity. And when students challenge these ethnic identities, so they behave in a way that is not the expected way, they are treated more harshly. Now, this does link in with what we talked about in terms of ideal pupil. Now, Archer identifies three types of pupil identity. The first being the ideal pupil. 
And this is the sort of identity that is given, or perhaps a better word to say, is applied to white middle class heteronormative students who are hardworking, achieve as expected in normal ways, and they have abilities and talents. Archer then identifies what he calls the pathological, patho I can't say that word, pathologized pupil. And this could be described as the deserving poor. Students who are um, from a deprived background, but they're plodding along, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They slog through the education system, but they don't have any particular natural talent or natural ability. They're your kind of invisible students. And I, I really dislike that word, but they're the invisible students who just do the job day to day. And Archer suggests that this um, type of um, identity is often applied to um, Asian and um, ethnic minorities, whereas the final one, the demonized pupil, um, often, which is identified as working class, hypersexualized, unintelligent, peer led, culturally deprived, and a perpetual underachiever. This gets applied to other ethnic minorities, and again, they're treated in that uh, according to that um, stereotype, and that can then lead to the self fulfilling prophecy. It's like, well, if you think I'm unintelligent, if you think I'm going to underachieve, well, why am I going to bother trying? Okay. So our third internal factor is looking at pupil responses and subcultures. So this is how students respond to the labelling, how they respond to um, the racism or the discrimination that they may face within the education system. And the first thing we've got is the, the idea of the rejection of labels. Now, we've already talked about this in terms of Fuller's study at GCSE level, but Macken Garhill, again, probably mispronouncing that horribly, actually backs up Fuller's findings when looking at A-level students. So both these groups point, uh, both these studies show us that just because a particular stereotypical label um, has been applied to a student who is from a specific ethnic background, doesn't mean that they then live up to that or internalise it and make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Secondly, you've got Mertzer who talks about failed coping strategies and Mertzer highlights how some pupils are not able to develop the coping strategies when they're faced with this labelling, when they're faced with the discriminatory or racial um, stereotypes. Instead, um, what they do is they almost back away from um, dealing with it, they will avoid the teachers that put on these or, or provide, provide, no, that's not the right word, who um, give out these labels or who have these labels um, for particular students. They will not take particular options at GCSE or A-level because of the teachers who, are t who teach those subjects and they don't want to be labelled in a particular way and they won't engage in the lesson. They will get on and get on, do the work, but they won't actively engage. Now, Mertzer also identifies three types of teacher racism. These are specific to, to teachers. And that's not to say that all teachers are racist, they're not, but these are the three categories of racism that are shown by teachers. The first, is what's referred to as the colorblind. These are the teachers who don't see ethnicity, that all students are the same, which denies the ethnic identity of some of their students. They whitewash their students. And they quite often these teachers don't think that they're being racist in any way, that they're being equal to all students. But what they're in fact doing is symbolic it's symbolic violence it, it's saying i don't see your cultural background i don't see your ethnic identity you're just a, another face in my classroom okay and that can be a form of symbolic violence 
these are the sort of teachers that a student will, uh, an ethnic minority student will avoid because they they don't want to have their culture denied. They don't want to experience that symbolic violence. You then got the liberal chauvinists who have low expectations of ethnic minorities due to cultural deprivation. And it's just, oh, that's just the way it is. I'll help them, I'll get them, I'll do the best for them, but they don't expect much from them. And again, this is where we see students avoiding those particular subjects, avoiding those particular teachers, because like, well, they don't think I'm gonna be any good, so why would I wanna be around them? And then finally, you've obviously got your overtly racist teachers. Now, I'd like to think that most of these teachers have been identified and um, are no longer in the profession, but there are going to be those who are overtly racist as well. The third part of subcultures comes from Sewell, and he focuses particularly on black boys and how they respond to racism. And Sewell argues that when faced with racism within the education system, when faced with stereotypical labeling black boys will form one of or follow one of four subcultures so they'll either become a conformist which in Sewell's study was the largest group um, of students who um, accept the values of the school they are um, eager to succeed at school so they will um, almost become so pro-school um, that they're, even if they're not doing academically well, they are doing everything they should do. They're, they're almost like um, trying to um, deny their ethnic background. You then got the rebels who are the most influential, but the small one of the smaller groups of students and these reject the values of the school and oppose the school by joining a peer group anti-school subculture um, and almost have a um, habitat of black machoism where they reinforce that stereotype of rebellion and anti-authority um, and although they're a small group, they're a loud group, which reinforces that stereotype. The retreatists are those students who, again, are a small minority who feel isolated and disconnected with not only the school, but also their peer group and their um, ethnic group. And they just kind of keep a low profile and plod along almost within the same thing as what um, Archer was talking about in terms of the pathologized student. And finally, you get the innovators. And this is the second largest group within um, black boys, according to Sewell. And these are students who reject school, but are pro-education. So they want to do well, they want to do academically well, but they just don't like schools. They find schools, if you like, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, they're institutionally racist, so they're not there to help them. So they will find other ways of achieving academically. And that leads us on to the idea of institutional racism. So what do we mean by that? Institutional racism is when a social institution, be it education, be it um, the police force, the criminal justice system, the NHS, any form of social institution, that has racist policies and procedures. They're not saying that everybody that works within that institution is racist, just that the, race, the, the system itself is racist. And this can be broken down into three types of racism. The first being structural. And this is where you have the rules and processes within schools. And I'm gonna use schools as the example that are racist. Maybe it's a uniform policy, maybe it's a hair policy, things like that that will not intentionally perhaps be racist, but unintentionally be racist. And the same goes for culture. Culture, the culture of the school, the culture of the institution might be racist. It's the way things are done. It's the way that we, the way that we think as a um, institution can be racist. 
And of course, you will still get those individual racists as well. Now, hopefully, again, we can weed those out and get rid of them from the education system. But there are going to be racists who individuals within an institution who are racist. I'm not saying that's right or that's correct. We're human. OK, so how is the education system racist? Now, remember, we're not talking necessarily here about an individual school, although we have seen examples recently, for example, Pimlico Academy, where the nature of that school is considered racist what we're talking about here is the education system as a whole and the first thing we need to talk about is critical racism theory or critical race theory which comes from Rathmeyer and Rathmeyer sees racism as a feature of modern society they're not saying that that means it's okay it's not but it is part of society and it's so ingrained within the history and within the um, culture of an institution that is no longer even identified as being racist. It's inevitable and it's no longer conscious thought. So the processes in, in schools that are so long in the tooth, so ingrained, that they then lead to, that they need changing because they, they are essentially racist. Marketization policies and segregation. So Gilborn points out that marketization allows for more covert selection to take place, which can lead to segregation. So schools were, won't advertise in certain areas because they don't want students from that particular area. They won't. Um, they'll have certain uniform policies which may exclude certain ethnic minorities from going to school there. Um, things like that and the Commission for Racial Equality in 1993 noted that covert selection processes led to ethnic minority students um, more to be more likely to go to the unpopular schools or the um, less achieving schools, the more disadvantaged schools, because they feel excluded through these covert um, selection processes from attending the good schools in that those areas next we've got ethnocentrism and Paul um, sorry Ball refi refers to this as little Englandism and what he's talking about here is the fact that the curriculum that we teach in schools is all about the hoorah Henry isn't Britain great isn't England wonderful type curriculum rather than celebrating diversity um, and Tronia and Bell point out the fact that it is very much a westernized curriculum and they use modern foreign languages as an example of this the lot the the what's the phrase I'm looking for the language that is spoken by the majority of the planet is Chinese by proportion of population, swiftly followed by French uh, or variations on French. But we teach French, Spanish, and German predominantly in schools. We don't teach Asian um, languages as a matter of course. You can do them as an extracurricular, but you, they're not part of the, cur the curriculum. Um, and the languages that schools choose don't tend to reflect the ethnic makeup of their students. So the curriculum at the moment tends to reflect very much the English culture. Now, there are changes occurring and we'll come on to the evaluation in a moment, but um, it's still very much white British middle class culture that is taught through the curriculum. Sanders and Horn talk about the assessment systems being institutionally racism, racist and argue that the changing from um, written test to teacher te assessment, particularly in primary school, with the key stage two tests and key stage one tests being teacher assessments, are allow for cultural biases. And this has particularly come again w recently with tags and CAGs and the messed up situation that we have with A levels and GCSEs due to COVID, that one of the things that people were saying is we don't want 
teacher assess grades or centre assess grades because there will be unconscious biases, there will be racism, there will be negativity towards certain students, which means that they may not achieve the grades that they should achieve. And even when the or uh, Sanders and Horn even um, argue that when we do in class assessments, we will have unconscious biases towards students that will affect how we mark their work. Now, hopefully, I, I'm not doing that, but I'm sure there are elements that could um, that, that could be flagged up as that. Um, Gilborn also points out that the system is rigged to validate the dominant culture superiority. So when you did the Alice tests at the beginning of year 12, if you did the um, CAT tests in year 7, a lot of the um, ways the questions were worded were very ethnocentric to white curriculum. And those tests can, in particular the CAT test, can be influential in terms of setting and streaming. Access to opportunities. Um, ethnic minorities are often left out of gifted and talented programs um, and are less likely to be in the highest sets and streams, as we've said before, probably due to CAT tests or um, unconscious biases and um, uh, ethnocentric curriculum. And this prevents them from having the same access to opportunities that the ethnic majority have which can lead to educational underachievement. And the final um, way that the education system is racist is what's called new IQism. And this comes from Gilborn and Udell. Um, and what they argue is that teachers and policy makers make false assumptions about the nature of people's ability and potential. They see potential as fixed and measured through things like IQ tests and psychometric tests. But Gilborn suggests that these tests only test what we know currently, not what we could learn. So you might, the students who did particularly badly in a CAT test, maybe they had a bad day, didn't sleep very well, maybe they weren't feeling well, maybe they get exam anxiety. That's not their potential. That's how well they performed on the day. Um, and these can then um, affect educational achievement because it can lead to setting and streaming and things like that that we've already discussed. And they, these tests, as I've said before, are skewed towards the dominant culture. They're, 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 they're covertly racist by, if you're not understanding the scenario that's in the question, because it's something that's not something that you've experienced or something that you understand, that can lead to underachievement in education. So um, let's evaluate the, this institutional racism as a um, form of educational underachievement. There are curriculum changes. There's been a huge push in the last couple of years for decolonisation of the curriculum, for increased diversity within the curriculum in terms of things like what we teach, who we teach about, um, how we present data this is an ongoing slow moving train um it's very difficult to just suddenly change the, the curriculum but there are moves to change both in individual school level and at dfe level there's changes in teacher training and we talked about this before where teach tra training teachers are now being taught about labeling theory to be made aware of it and to be aware of their cultural and, and unconscious biases to put to kind of if you're aware of something you can do something about it if you're not aware of it you can't do anything about it so it's, it's changes in in um, training that are also helping to overcome um institutional racism and there is a huge push to recruit more bame teachers and uh, uh, making um ethnic minority people aware that they that there is no reason that they shouldn't join the teaching profession and having those role models in schools can help to push educational achievement. Um, now, I know that in Wyndham College, we don't have a particularly diverse staff. Part of the reason for that is that Norfolk is not the most diverse of 
um, counties and you can't force anyone to apply for a job at a particular school. But if they can recruit more ethnic minorities into teacher tra training programs, if you can recruit more um, ethnic minorities into the teaching profession, then we can see more diversity within the um, classroom in terms of the classroom teacher. Okay, so just to recap then, we're looking at both the, the we're looking at the external factors which lead to educational um, achievement by ethnicity. We looked at the cultural deprivation, um, material deprivation and racism in wider society and how those factors can influence educational achievement for ethnic minorities. And then in school, looking at labeling, pupil identities and institutional racism and those factors which can lead to educational underachievement for 